welcome again, everyone, to the Plant-Based Nutrition Support Group Virtual Lecture Series. I'm Lisa A. Smith, the Executive Director of the Plant-Based Nutrition Support Group. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So happy to have you all here. You're in for a treat tonight. Uh, Carolyn Trapp, who has been doing diabetes education for PBNSG for years now, will be presenting to you guys uh, the relevance of, of type 2 or type diabetes and COVID-19 and kind of some things you want to look out for and be mindful of with this particular chronic disease. If you, if this is your first virtual series with us, uh, this is a four part series. Tonight is the fourth in our first installment, but the very next one starts next Wednesday. So show back up here next Wednesday, 7 p.m. We'll have Dr. Bob Brakey lecturing on remaining vital in a pandemic prone world. So Dr. Bob Brakey is actually our chairman of the board here at PBNSG. Um, and so he is a plant-based physician who will be talking about remaining vital in a pandemic prone world. So that's next Wednesday, 7 p.m. Again, if for any reason you can't make it, we do record these, we do send out the recordings. Um, and for those of you who are just starting your journey or want some more resources, be sure to visit pbnsg.org where you can pick up a copy of our recipe book. Um, there you can also join our Sprout Club. Uh, and then you also get access to all of the events that we have coming up. Make sure you're on our email list. We have a lot going on. Um, so I am so happy to introduce Carolyn. I'm going to let her take it away. Uh, Carolyn, if, if, if at any time um, you want to pause for questions or anything, I'm, ha I'm here. I'll moderate. I'll watch the chat so you can just talk and I'll catch anything you might have missed. And then at the end, we we'll begin. Okay, very good. Well, welcome everyone. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you. Try and share my screen with you. Uh, let's see, we want this. And let's see. Oh, there we go. Yay, it's always nice when the technology works. Okay, oh, <laughs> I'm not sure where that came from. <laughs> Okay, we should be okay. All right, so um, first of all, just a little background. Um, I am a nurse practitioner. I've worked in primary care for um, over 20 years, and um, I have been interested in diabetes since the beginning of my career. It always seemed to me as a, a disease where um, a lot of the um, treatment <laughs> were things that people could do on their own. And I also, um, it, within my primary care practice, had the experience of using a lot of medications and helping people achieve really good numbers, but I saw them go on to develop complications of diabetes, even with tight control. Um, I also saw them have side effects from medications. So, and, and they complained of the cost of the medication. So I started to develop a, a concern about overuse of medication. And um, some of you on this call have heard me speak to the plant-based nutrition support group about overuse of medication and about deprescribing medication for type two diabetes. Um, a really interesting idea. Um, I now work for a nonprofit organization. Many of you are fans of Dr. Neil Barnard and I work with him at the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. Um, I also am in the process, I haven't listed it here on this title slide, but I'm joining a, a medical practice called Rochester Lifestyle Medicine. And, I, and I'll tell you a little bit more about what they do at the end of this talk, um, but I will be seeing patients through Rochester Lifestyle Medicine through telehealth. So um, through my clinical experience and my work with the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, um, I have been involved in plant-based nutrition for diabetes now for 11 years. Um, and I've been involved in using it in my own clinical practice, seeing patients get better, seeing patients use less medication. And I've also been involved in community education programs, including with Native Americans, especially uh, the Navajo in Arizona and New Mexico and some other tribes. And then I've also been involved with a lot of professional education where I work with doctors and nurse practitioners and nurses and dietitians to help them learn about plant-based nutrition. So uh, 
Lisa and the committee at PBNSG asked me if I would talk about diabetes and COVID-19. So we'll focus on that today. And I'm hoping I can give you some pearls that will be helpful for you and people you know and love. And um, we can uh, connect you to some good resources as well. So first of all, um, what is COVID-19? Um, I know you are seeing lots of information. We are being bombarded with this and you're probably all now very familiar with this image that, that we see everywhere. The novel coronavirus disease of 2019 is caused by an infection from the newly emerged highly contagious coronavirus SARS-CoV-2, is its proper name. And it mainly invades the respiratory tract and lungs leading to a new type of coronavirus pneumonia. <clears throat> Severe cases can rapidly progress to acute respiratory distress syndrome, also known as ARDS, and septic shock and multiple organ failure. We hear of people uh, who have severe COVID requiring kidney dialysis. Uh, people who are at the greatest risk of developing COVID-19 or dying from it are elderly individuals, along with those with pre-existing conditions such as cancer, cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, and acute kidney injury. And type 2 diabetes, depending on what sources you look at, is either the first or second most common comorbidity of COVID-19. And I saw that Dr. Milton Mills had posted recently that 95% of people who die of COVID have an underlying condition. So it's really important that we address those and control them whenever possible. So these are just the most recent stats of COVID-19 in Michigan. Um, this was from yesterday. And the darker the color, the higher the rate. And, <clears throat> In our counties, um, Oakland County has had 7,573 confirmed cases with 774 deaths. Macomb County has had 5,832 confirmed cases with 662 deaths. And Wayne County has set 7,571 cases with 1,973 deaths. So we're certainly concerned about this. Um, you know, we're one of the national hotspots and where we are in Michigan, um, we've been heavily impacted. So this was a brand new article just published this week and it's a busy graphic, but I wanna explain it to you. It's called the Association of Blood Glucose Control and outcomes in patients with COVID-19 and pre-existing type 2 diabetes. And this study came out of Wuhan, China. And we've heard that diabetes is a, a comorbidity, puts you at greater risk of both getting COVID-19 and dying from it. Um, but this is a, a first study coming out of China that looked at which people with diabetes did the worst. And it'll come as no surprise to you that those who had poorly controlled diabetes were at the greatest risk of death. Um, and, and in fact, only 1% of those who had um, type 2 diabetes on admission to the hospital with COVID-19 died. Now, they, this study differentiated well-controlled diabetes and poorly controlled diabetes. So I dug into it a little bit to see how did they define those terms. And I was really interested to see that well-controlled diabetes was, had an upper limit of 10 millimoles, or that what that would be equivalent of is a blood sugar of 180 and poorly controlled blood glucose had an upper limit above 10. So a blood sugar above 180. So that would be equivalent of either good control would be considered an A1C up to 7.9% and anything above 9%, above 8% um, increases the risk of dying of COVID-19. Now there's a stepwise approach to that and the higher the worse off. So most of the deaths 
occurred in people who had A1Cs of 9% or higher. And this was in China, um, where I, I think people um, are, are sometimes a little healthier in terms of lifestyle than they are here in the United States. So we'll, we'll talk about that as well. So um, let's see here. Okay. Um, okay. So this was this was interesting. Um, I was looking into a little bit. Why is it that people who have diabetes are have higher risk of complications due to? diabetes. And there were a couple of mechanisms proposed. So this gets into a little complicated pathophysiology, but basically the, um, this article suggested two mechanisms. And one is to gain entry into target cells that are affected by this virus. Um, COVID-19 hijacks an endocrine pathway that places a crucial role in blood pressure regulation metabolism and inflammation. These are all things that are familiar terms with diabetes, right? This may affect both insulin resistance, which is the underlying concern in type two diabetes. And there is also some thought that the virus may affect beta cell function, causing insulin insufficiency. So the cells that make insulin in our body can be affected. So that's what we typically think of, it, of being the underlying problem in type one diabetes, but people with type 2 can have some insulin insufficiency too. A second mechanism is DPP4 enzyme concentration. Um, these are enzymes in the gut that help to regulate blood sugar, and they may worsen glucose and insulin metabolism and increase inflammation. Now, both of these are mechanisms that can be targeted by diabetes drugs. And of course, that's why researchers often look at you know, what are the underlying problems and how can we use pharmacotherapy to improve outcomes. Um, and the article concluded that the clinical relevance is currently uncertain. So they didn't make any specific recommendations um, around treating COVID-19 with diabetes drugs at this time. Okay, so bear with me just a minute because I'm trying to, um, okay, there we go, I wanna get. All right, so how can we protect ourselves if we have diabetes or are at risk of diabetes from COVID-19? So I wanna share with you oops, some um, slides that I put together recently for a collaborative effort with NACA, which is Native Americans for Community Action. Many of you who are familiar with my work know that I've been working with Native Americans who have very high rates of diabetes. And NACA is an organization that works with 11 tribes in Flagstaff, um, and they're based in uh, tribes throughout Arizona and New Mexico. And um, I, I, you have heard about these things that we can all do to prevent the spread of germs. So I know you've seen this information, but have you seen it in the Navajo language? And I'm guessing you haven't. So I'm just going to share these with you to make this a little bit more interesting. So these are all good things that we can do to prevent the spread of germs. We can avoid close contact with people who are sick. We've been encouraged to stay home. We want to wash our hands often um, using soap and water or uh, antimicrobial solution, and we want to wash for at least 20 seconds. We want to clean and disinfect any areas that um, are touched frequently in our house, like doorknobs and faucets. Cover your cough or sneeze with a tissue and avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Um, so these are all good techniques to prevent the spread of infection. But is there more that we can do? And the answer is yes, absolutely. So this is a great time to be taking good care of ourselves. So first of all, um, physical activity is really important. Um, walking is a great activity, um, but anything that we can do to get a heart rate up a little bit. Um, getting adequate sleep, it has, lots of studies have shown this is important for glucose control and metabolism, weight control. And then lastly, if you smoke, 
um, this is a great time to quit smoking. So these are some of the lifestyle interventions. But of course, most of all, this group is especially aware of nutrition and, and its benefits. And that's something that I talk to Native Americans about quite a bit, that plant foods promote health and a plant-based diet's been shown to be a great intervention with diabetes and other chronic diseases. So we know these are full fruits and beans and grains and fruits and vegetables, um, small amounts of nuts and seeds and the preferred beverage is water or tea. Um, I want to connect this though to diabetes and to COVID and um, dietitian Lee Crosby who works for PCM came up with this great analogy and our, um, the, our blood vessels that carry red blood cells throughout our body are much like roads that transport goods throughout the state and when we breathe, we bring, lung, uh, we bring oxygen into our lungs where it's stored, um, much like a warehouse. And we need these blood, our red blood cells to travel the highways um, to go to the lungs or the, the warehouse, if you will, <laughs> to pick up oxygen and to carry it throughout our bodies. Well, when we get sick um, with chronic diseases like diabetes and high blood pressure or asthma, it's as if the, the roadways are filled with potholes or that there are barriers on, on, the, on the road to keep the, the trucks um, or the red blood cells from getting where they need to go. So as we know, um, good healthcare, good self-care helps to rebuild our blood vessels and protect our blood vessels and protect our organs um, from chronic high blood sugar. And now it has the added benefit of protecting us from viruses such as COVID-19. So what to eat? Well, um, you're familiar with this, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time, but what plant-based nutrition support group meeting would be complete without some pictures of some delicious foods. So these are some things that we've been enjoying in our house, um, bean burritos, bean chili, uh, a hearty salad with brown rice and black beans. And I chose, these are all ingredients that are pretty easy to find and easy to store and, um, and actually are pretty much the same in each of these three meals, um, but they can uh, be made to taste very different uh, depending on how you prepare them. So I like, always like to share stories of some former patients and today I'm gonna share this one with you. Um, this is Mr. G who allows me to tell his story. He's a high school teacher. Um, he was at his worst, was on over 200 units of insulin a day. When he changed his diet, he started to have more energy and he started walking and then running and he's now completed three Ironman competitions and um, is off his, all of his in insulin and his blood pressure medication, his antidepressant, um, his cholesterol medication. Uh, this is a picture of a woman from the Navajo Nation. She is a nutritionist. She was really embarrassed when she was diagnosed with diabetes because here she was supposed to be teaching how to take uh, good care of yourself with diet. And here she is about 40 pounds lighter. Um, she's reversed her diabetes, gotten off of her medication. And she jokes about how the bus driver makes fun of her because um, she's running to the bus and holding up her skirt because she's lost all of this weight. Um, so, and I like to share this because the, um, the way the Navajo people is so different from the way we live here in, in Metro Detroit. We have access to uh, uh, healthy food and, and lots of good medical care um, and medications of all sorts. And even without those resources, um, people, um, without even the resources maybe to make lifestyle changes, uh, people have been very successful there in changing their diet. And I think we can be really inspired by stories such as this one um, from Mark. So this was a picture I took on the Navajo Nation. Um, this was next to a community garden and they used this expression, food is medicine. And um, boy, that's never been more true, right? And here's a picture of a native elder, a woman on the side 
Um, so we talk about just uh, reconnecting with ancient wisdom. Um, and although Native Americans are thought to have been great hunters and you know, they relied on buffalo, um, actually, especially in the Southwest, they ate a lot of fruits and vegetables and beans and corn is a grain. And uh, they had very low rates of diabetes until um, we started moving them off of their lands and um, separating them from water and, and um, providing them with commodity foods. So that's all I'm going to say about Indian country, but I, I hope that um, you'll, you'll find inspiration there. And we have additional resources at a website called nativepowerplate.org if you'd like to see some great videos. Okay, so you've heard the message over and over that we should avoid or limit animal products and added fats. And this is true for viruses and COVID-19 because if we can improve our metabolism, um, we can improve our ability to fight infection. So uh, many of you are familiar with this picture uh, that Dr. Barnard uses in his talk about fat inside muscle cells and how that interferes with uh, insulin, the ability of insulin to do its job. So briefly, insulin, when we eat, insulin's released by the pancreas and hooks up with these red insulin receptors on the cell wall that signals glucose receptors. And the, that allows glucose or sugar that's in the bloodstream to come into the muscle cell where it gets burned up for fuel. So that's normal metabolism. Um, in people who have insulin resistance or type two diabetes, um, that fat builds up inside the muscle cells and interferes with the ability of insulin to do its job. So the fat can come from beef, chicken, fish, cheese, uh, uh, corn oils, vegetable oils, olive oil, any of these foods that are full of fat can uh, lead to insulin resistance and, and type 2 diabetes and worsening type 2 diabetes control. So these are all really important foods to set aside. Now, I didn't mention sugar, and I should, um, because certainly uh, sugar is not a health food, and foods that contain sugar also often contain um, fat, and um, in combination, these can be really problematic. Um, but it's not just about sugar. And um, we know that the people who really reduce or eliminate animal fats, um, foods that come from animals, and added oils often see tremendous improvements in their blood sugars. Um, I always like to share pictures of plant-based athletes because um, if you, you don't have to take this on faith, a lot of uh, really high-level athletes now are completely uh, fueled by plants and, and have done really well with their athletic performance. Okay, so let's just talk a little bit more about diabetes and tight control. And um, this is a topic of great interest to me because I had always been taught that um, our goal in, in helping people with diabetes is to get blood sugars as low as possible um, within the normal range. And we talk about um, a hemoglobin A1C below 7%. This is the target from the American Diabetes Association or below 6.5% from the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists. And this is thought of as the holy grail um, of diabetes management. And I'm sure many of you, when you see your doctors or healthcare professionals have been encouraged to, to get your numbers down. And the, the way we do this is often, you know, we encourage people to eat a healthy diet and get some exercise, um, but also to use medications. And we start with one medication and then we add a second and then a third, um, or we go to an injectable or insulin to help people achieve these numbers. Well, in 2018, um, the American College of Physicians reviewed all of the major studies that have been used by the ADA and other organizations to come up with this target of less than 7% for, for A1C. And what they found was very interesting. Um, they actually, then this was the article that they published on this. And basically what they found, let me just look and see, oh, I didn't include the next slide that I wanted, but 
Um, basically, what they found was that the um, benefit of tight control with medication did not outweigh the risk of tight control with medication. And because of that, um, they suggest, and this is guidance statement number two right here, you can re read it, clinicians should aim to achieve an A1C below, between seven and 8% in most patients with type two diabetes. And I think that that's really interesting because remember the second or third slide I showed you showed that people who had an A1C below uh, of 8% or lower had much lower risk of complications from COVID-19. So these, these guidelines are in line with each other. And what this means is that we, um, that, that if you have an A1C between seven and 8%, um, you don't necessarily need to add more medications to get your A1C lower. And in fact, adding more medication can be risky. Um, it can, it, depending on the medication, it can put you at risk for hypoglycemia, which um, leads to a lot of hospitalizations for people and emergency room visits, and it is really dangerous. Um, it's linked to memory issues and dementia. So we really want to do everything we can to avoid hypoglycemia. Um, Over-medication use also can lead to weight gain. Many of the pills for diabetes, surprisingly, um, cause people to cause increased appetite or fluid retention, and that can lead to a problematic weight gain. So we don't want to use medications to push A1C down outside of this range between 7 and 8%. Now, that said, there's no problem with using lifestyle interventions to get an A1C in that target range of less than 7%. And many people who change to a plant-based diet have seen their A1C drop quite a bit. Um, while I'm talking about medication, I want to make the point too that we want to be really careful about um, low blood sugar when we change our diet. So if you're on a medication like insulin or a sulfonylurea pill like Micronase or Diabeta or Amaryl or Glyburide or Glimipiride. Um, those are pills that can cause low blood sugar. And if you change your diet, even if you've never had low blood sugar before, all of a sudden those medications can become too strong. So you want to recognize low blood sugar if it happens. You might feel shaky or sweaty or lightheaded. And you want to treat it um, by eating a piece of fruit or having some fruit juice. Um, and follow up with your healthcare professional to reduce your medication. Okay, so does the way we get to tight control matter? And yes, the answer is yes. And I've, I've just discussed that. And as I mentioned, it's riskier with medication and safer with lifestyle interventions like a healthy plant-based diet. Um, I also would like to share a little bit more information about medications for people who have or are suspected to have COVID-19. And I thought this was really interesting. This is from a brand new article. It was just published in the last couple of months. Um, and let's see, it was called Practical Recommendations for the Management of Diabetes in Patients with COVID-19. And um, the authors made this nice chart where they listed some of the different classes of drugs that are commonly used for diabetes and um, specific consideration. So the first one is metformin or glucophage, and this is the most widely prescribed pill for diabetes. And they state that dehydration and lactic acidosis, which is a condition where your body doesn't get rid of lactic acid, and it can lead to liver failure. Um, and this will probably occur if, in patients who become dehydrated. So patients on metformin with COVID-19 um, should be very careful to not get dehydrated and should follow sick day rules, which I'm gonna talk about. So this idea about dehydration, you're gonna hear over and over. Um, it's a, if you are sick, 
with the flu um, up from any virus, from COVID-19 or, or anything else, the thing that puts people in the hospital with diabetes is dehydration. You know, if we're throwing up, um, if we have a fever and we're sweating a lot, if we have diarrhea, you're losing a lot of fluid. So my important take home message today is make sure you're well hydrated and even more so if you take any medication for diabetes. So uh, to go on with metformin, during an illness, um, renal function, kidney function should be carefully monitored be because of the high risk of developing kidney disease with COVID-19. Um, the second class of medications listed are the SGL, SG co, I'm sorry, the sodium glucase co-transporter 2 inhibitors. And I've only got the generic names for them, um, canagliflozin, dapagliflozin, and empagliflozin. And I'm drawing a complete blank on what the um, brand names are for those. The honest truth is I've never written a single prescription for this class of drugs um, because of some of the concerns and because of the high costs of these drugs um, and because they're really third line agents. They're, they're never anything that would be prescribed a diagnosis, so I don't use them. Um, but um, there may be some benefits to them. There are some articles that suggest um, that they may have some benefit beyond glucose control. Um, in people who have heart failure. So I, I want to encourage you to talk with your healthcare provider who knows you best uh, about the drugs. But with this class, um, if you were to develop the flu or COVID-19, um, again, there's a risk of dehydration and diabetic ketoacidosis, um, which can be a really dangerous condition. Um, so in that situation, it's recommended to stop these drugs and to follow the sick day rules that we'll talk about. Um, people should not go on this class of drugs whoops, during a respiratory illness, and it's really important to monitor kidney function uh, with a blood test if you're taking these drugs. Okay. Um, and then here are the other classes of drugs, the glucagon-like peptide one receptor agonist. These are the uh, DPP-4 inhibitors, uh, the Genuvia would be a, an example of this drug. Um, and uh, you are also at risk of developing dehydration um, with this class. Um, the DPP-4 inhibitors are um, uh, Victoza is a commonly used uh, DPP-4. I'm sorry, I've mixed these up. The GLP-1 is Victoza and the DPP-4 is is um, Genuvia. And um, Genuvia and others in the class like alogliptin, linagliptin, um, saxagliptin, and citagliptin, which is Genuvia, um, these actually are generally well tolerated and can be continued. Um, the only thing though that I would say about these drugs is they really have a very low, uh, they're not all that effective. They lower A1C about half a percent and they're very expensive. So um, they were never my first choice in, in drugs for people who have uncontrolled diabetes um, and aren't able to make lifestyle changes. And then the last class of drugs that I'll mention is, the, um, is insulin. And insulin, of course, is of all these drugs, insulin is the medication that can lower A1C the most. And if you are on insulin and you develop COVID-19, you don't want to stop insulin. It's really important to continue to um, keep blood sugars under control, although you may want to monitor your blood sugar more often. And the dose may need to be adjusted. If you're sick, you may be eating less or you may be eating differently, and you may not need as much insulin or you may need more insulin. Um, and then lastly, they end with a recommendation that people on these medications with COVID, of course, should be in close contact with their healthcare providers. Um, where we can use telemedicine, this is ben really beneficial and much better than going into an ER or an urgent care center where you're at risk of, of being in contact with more people. Um, I wanna share with you some sick day guidelines. And this is from the, uh, I get this, from the CDC website. 
So if you're sick with anything, any kind of virus, it's really, and you have diabetes and you're on medication for diabetes, it's really important to um, have, be knowledgeable about these considerations. First of all, in general, we recommend people continue to take their insulin and their other diabetes pills, um, test blood sugar more often, drink water or tea, four to six ounces every half hour to prevent dehydration while you're awake. Try to eat as normally as you try to eat as you normally would. Weigh yourself daily if you see that you're losing weight a lot without um, uh, changing your diet. This can actually be a, a problem, and you want to, and it may be a sign that you're not getting enough insulin. Either your body's not making enough insulin, or you're not injecting enough insulin. Um, so that would be an important situation to discuss with your healthcare provider. And as we now have heard over and over with COVID, um, we want to be aware of, of what our temperature is. And if you're sick, you should check your temperature every morning and evening. Okay. Um, when should you call or visit the emergency room? We'll just hear some really good parameters. If you have any trouble breathing, if you have ketones in your urine, and this is something that would be a routine practice, hopefully for people who have type one diabetes to make sure they're getting enough insulin. Um, they can get strips and check their urine for ketones. Um, if for anybody type one or type two, if you can't keep liquids down for more than four hours, if you lose five or more pounds during the course of an illness, if your blood sugar is below 60 or whatever parameter your healthcare provider has given you, um, you would want to check in with your healthcare provider. If you feel too sick to eat normally or are unable to keep food down for more than 24 hours, if you're vomiting or have severe diarrhea for more than six hours, if your temperature is above 101 degrees for 24 hours, and you don't have to wait for this magic number. If, if you're at 100 and you don't feel well or you have any of these other conditions, by all means, check in with your healthcare professional. And if you feel sleepy or you can't think clearly, have somebody call your doctor or healthcare professional or take you to the emergency room. Um, I wanted to give you some useful financial resources. Um, if, you're, if the cost of insulin is problematic, um, the ADA on their website or at this site, insulinhelp.org, lists the contact phone numbers for um, three insulin manufacturers and something called the Mankind Support Programs. And you can call them and um, uh, they'll help you fill out a form or you can go online, fill out a form and um, be eligible, um, hopefully to receive insulin at a discount. Um, I want to encourage you to visit this website. If this is something that you're interested in, they have a really nice description of what information you'll be asked when you call. And it's great to have all of that in front of you before you get on the phone. Um, if you are having problems uh, affording insulin or other medications, these are all discount programs that may be able to help. And um, these are also available through the insulinhelp.org website or the ADA website, which is just diabetes.org. So please reach out for help. Um, often healthcare professionals have samples of medications, but of course many practices are closed right now and you really can't rely on that for long-term support. So um, accessing these resources um, can be really helpful. I was curious about where can people get food? Um, we have a big problem in this country with food insecurity. Um, I read today in the New York Times that one in five children right now are food insecure, are not getting enough to eat. And with schools closed, um, you know, this is a big problem. Um, I know at the YMCA where my husband works, they've been providing uh, sacks of, of groceries or meals to people to they can get in the parking lot. Um, and I look to see 
if I could find any resources providing plant-based meals. And I wanna share with you that Nash Pet in Detroit has this program going on where um, people can buy a $15 meal card that can be donated to somebody who needs it for a meal. And also um, for a donation of $25, uh, they'll put together a bag of groceries. So I'm not aware of other local places that are providing plant-based meals. I know the Esselstyn Foundation um, is providing plant-based meals, but I, I, I think that's just in Ohio. I'm not sure they're working with others. Um, but I, I think this is a good resource to share. And when we get to Q&A, if you're aware of other resources for medications, for healthcare, for food, uh, by all means, let's share those. Um, this got a little out of, out of order here, but I wanted to list um, what should go in a sick day kit um, to be sure and have available uh, for people who have diabetes and are on medications and are at risk of getting sick, what things should you have in your house? So in terms of medication and supplies, milk of magnesia, a medicine to control diarrhea, um, an antacid, a pain reliever like Tylenol, a thermometer, and suppositories to treat vomiting are all recommended by the CDC. And then some specific foods that we can have. Um, you know, in this age of pandemic, um, many of these, I, I'm sure your house, I hope your house is well stocked um, right now and you're not relying on a trip to the grocery store, but. Uh, we used to always want to make sure that we taught people who were on insulin um, to have these things available in the event that they got sick quickly. Um, so things like sports drinks provide sugar and electrolytes, juice boxes, canned soup, ginger ale, instant cooked cereals like oatmeal. Um, normally we'd, we'd want a high fiber oatmeal, but um, they may not want as much fiber um, if, if you've got a stomach upset. Uh, crackers and unsweetened applesauce are all good things to just have available. If you can't eat meals and you're on diabetes medications, you will need to eat or drink about 50 grams of carbohydrate every four hours. And that would be the equivalent of uh, one and a half cups of unsweetened applesauce or one and a half cups of fruit juice. Okay, so um, to summarize here, what are some recommendations? Number one, reduce exposure, wash your hands, practice physical distancing. Number two is get metabolically healthy. And what do I mean by that? Well, it's not just blood sugar. We also want to control blood pressure and cholesterol. And all of the lifestyle interventions that I've talked about are really effective at reducing and controlling blood pressure and cholesterol. But if you're on medications for these, um, it's important to continue these medications and to be in close contact with your healthcare professional to, um, to, with those conditions and to make sure they're well controlled. Number three, if you're diagnosed with COVID-19 and you don't have diabetes, monitor for new onset diabetes that can be triggered by the virus. And number four, if you have diabetes and get COVID-19, work on continuous and reliable glycemic control. And that was language that came out of one of the articles that I reviewed, um, but I, I think that's really important that we wanna avoid erratic blood sugars, um, blood sugars going up and down, and we really wanna have a good plan in place to control blood sugar. So, um, let me end with some ideas of where you can get support. Um, of course, my number one resource is the Plant-Based Nutrition Support Group and Paul and Lisa and our many volunteers have worked really hard to create a, a, a huge community um, and there are a lot of great resources on the website. In addition, I wanna make you aware of the Rochester Lifestyle Medicine Institute and some of the community education programs that they put on um, that hundreds of people have been involved in and have found to be really useful. The first is a 15-day whole food plant-based community jumpstart program, or just the jumpstart program for short. And this is a program, it usually starts on Saturday and it's all web-based and you work with a group and a, um, a 
health coach and clinicians, and um, you get all kinds of great information about how to shift to a plant-based diet. And you work together with this group over the next 14 days. Um, week two, you come together for a potluck. And then uh, the last visit, you come together um, to share what you've learned. Um, people just rave about this program. Uh, hundreds of healthcare professionals have taken this, this course. Um, and it's $99 to participate. And the uh, website is, is listed here. You can go to rochesterlifestylemedicine.com to read more about this program. Um, this program started in Rochester, New York, but now it's available to people all over the country. And I am just can't say enough good about it. It's, it's really a wonderful program. Um, the other program I want to mention to you is the LIFT program. And this is a brand new program unlike anything uh, that I'm aware of. Um, this is, was a program developed by Darren Martin who created the CHIP program, which some of you may be uh, um, aware of. And CHIP is the Complete Health Improvement Program and it teaches people how to adopt a plant-based diet. Well, the LIFT program um, also encourages a plant-based diet, but that's just a small part of it. Um, and LIFT program is, introduces people to scientifically proven ways to lift your mood and improve your life um, through the fields of neuroscience, positive psychology, and lifestyle medicine. And my husband, Bill, and I are doing the program right now. We just finished week five. And I have to tell you, if it, I know that, that Darren was not designing this for a pandemic, but there couldn't be a better time to be gathering with other people to talk about what we can do to stay positive. So we meet twice a week. We meet for an hour. Um, the first, on, on, for my group, it's on Mondays, and then for half an hour on Thursdays. Um, there are right now uh, weekend programs as well as evening programs. Um, and that program also for 10 weeks, two, visit, two meetings a week is just $99. Um, the videos are phenomenal. There's a workbook that goes with it. I just can't say enough about this program. We've had so much fun with it. So I hope that you'll check it out. I also want to share with you some of the work that the Physicians Committee is doing. And if you're not a Physicians Committee member, this is a great time to join. Dr. Barnard is doing 30-minute member updates every Friday, and the next one is this coming Friday. And he talks about... Um, COVID-19, um, but he also talks about some of the different uh, programs that you can get involved in to help people get healthy and stay healthy. And one of the programs that we're working on right now um, is with slaughterhouses. And this is something you might not have thought about in terms of plant-based nutrition, um, but you've probably seen in the news that uh, slaughterhouses have been sources of people getting infected. Um, the employees at slaughterhouses um, have had really high rates of COVID-19 across the country. And here in Michigan, uh, we have several slaughterhouses. Um, one is BEF Foods, and that stands for Bob Evans Foods, and it's in Hillsdale, Michigan. And I'm going to be there um, with these signs next Tuesday. And I would love to have anybody who's interested come and uh, practice social distancing. We will keep our distance from each other. Uh, we will not be going into the plant. We will just be outside near the sign. Um, and uh, we've invited the press to come and um, we'll have some healthcare professionals there in white coats. Um, and we wanna get the word out that meat is not essential and that, um, we were really disappointed that the president mandated that meatpacking facilities stay open at this time, putting workers at risk and the people who consume the products that come out of these plants at risk. So if you're interested, I listed uh, Dr. Alley's email address here. It's Z for Zishan Alley, A-L-I at PCRM.org. And just shoot them an email, let them know you're interested, give us your cell phone number and your email address, and we'll be in touch with you with the details. 
Um, I wrote here that it's from 12 to one, but it's actually from 11 to 12. And Hillsdale is about an hour and 10 minutes west of Farmington Hills, Michigan. Um, and I'm gonna end, oh, I, one more thing about the Physicians Committee. Um, we now have a, a physician, uh, physician, um, sorry, I'm blanking on the name of it. I meant to drop it in here, but, but if you're looking for a doctor or a healthcare professional, who is plant-based and supportive of plant-based nutrition, you can go on our website. We're just um, gathering names now, but we'll be building that. So that's something to watch out for, physicianscommittee.org or pcrm.org. And um, I'm gonna end there. Um, my email address is not, oops, it um, does not have DMP in front of it. That's my title, Doctor of Nursing Practice. Um, my email address is Carol, Carolyn Trapp, np at gmail.com if you'd like to reach out to me after this presentation 